people need to get, get more comfortable with uh, failure. And when they fail, they'll just pick themselves up and try again. Herman, it's my distinct pleasure to spend time with you today for our Makers and Shapers series. For several decades, you have contributed massively to the world of technology and entrepreneurship in Europe. For anyone in tech, you don't need an introduction. I'll just say that, among many other things, you are the founder of Acorn Computers, which spun out ARM, uh, the leading chip design company. And in the late 90s, you founded Amadeus Capital Partners, a global venture capital firm. Can you uh, tell me more about Amadeus? Yes, Amadeus Capital Partners is a uh, deep technology venture fund. Uh, we have about uh, a billion uh, euros under management and we do uh, everything that's really hard to do. <laughs> I'm uh, one of the founding partners at Amadeus um, <clears throat> and I'm um, on uh, six boards of our uh, portfolio of uh, deep technology companies. Um, I invest in uh, quantum computing, uh, synthetic biology, um, blockchain, and uh, of course, AI and machine learning. In fact, we have a, a very large number of uh, AI investments in Europe. I'd like to know how you see a uh, European VC in the global uh, landscape. Uh, what works, what doesn't? Uh, well, we have a real problem uh, with uh, venture capital in Europe, although it is uh, improving. And the problem is, uh, that America has five times as much venture capital as Europe, and China has even more money uh, coming from the government for deep technology. Having said that, uh, we used to be uh, much further behind than the US uh, than, than we are now. So uh, things are improving considerably in Europe, in particular the returns that uh, European venture capital produces for the limited partners, the people who give us the money, are now better than the returns in the US. This was one of the problems why Europe had um, much less venture capital than the US. There's also much greater willingness now in Europe uh, for entrepreneurs to uh, uh, leave large companies or for entrepreneurs who've just finished their university study to start new companies so that there are many more projects available to be invested in. Uh, the other big change, of course, uh, is the European Innovation Council, uh, where we now have 10 billion uh, euros available for deep technology as part of Horizon Europe. And uh, I'm about the vice chair of uh, the European Innovation Council. And we've already spent over 500 million in our first year investing in 160 companies. So this is making a big uh, improvement in the situation for a deep technology venture capital in Europe. You touched upon it just now, the role of government in supporting uh, entrepreneurs. So uh, is that a good idea? Shall the state be hands-on or sh shall the government be hands-off rather and let the markets do the job? The main point about government uh, providing money for a deep technology is uh, that Europe is way behind the US and also China in supporting uh, technology companies. So in order to raise our game, uh, we will need uh, government support. And that's uh, one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the Europe, European Innovation Council, which of course is by far the largest uh, deep technology fund in Europe now. Important thing though, is that it always has to be market led. Uh, when governments try to um, have their own uh, venture capital funds that uh, lead themselves, uh, that's been proven not to work very well. I'd like to talk about uh, European tech sovereignty. Um, I think uh, it, it, this could be a matter that is dear to your heart, for example, in the context of, of NVIDIA buying ARM. Um, the industry commissioner Thierry Breton has warned about the implications uh, of, uh, of such a buyout. Uh, because of the global microchip uh, shortage, uh, especially, and uh, yeah, impacting European tech sovereignty. Technology uh, sovereignty is really uh, a key uh, issue for us uh, going forward, and there are only three 
areas in the world that have a chance to be technologically sovereign, and that is the US, China, and uh, Europe. It's very important that Europe has uh, the, the key technologies that it needs uh, for its governments to run properly and um, being able to support uh, our European society without becoming dependent on Americans uh, and American technology, as we are in many respects so with uh, uh, the famous uh, GAFA companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and uh, Apple, uh, where we've become uh, quite dependent in uh, social media and uh, search. And we've also become very dependent on Chinese manufacture. I'm particularly concerned about Britain in this respect. My view is that Brexit has been the biggest loss of British sovereignty since 1066. And the reason for that is that Britain has uh, no chance to be technologically sovereign. It only has a chance to be technologically sovereign within Europe because Britain has no 5G technology, for example. And 5G is one of those technologies that you absolutely have to have uh, for having a functioning government and a functioning uh, economy. The same thing is true for semiconductors. You have to have a semiconductor industry. Uh, Europe is, will, is spending 145 billion to bring a semiconductor industry back into Europe. Britain can't do that because it just doesn't have the money. The dependence, say, on American design software for chips is so severe uh, that uh, America can coerce Europe uh, and European companies to do things that hitherto was only possible with military occupation. But it's no longer necessary to occupy another country if you have this enormous power to coerce uh, other countries uh, with the technology uh, superiority that you have. So that's why technology sovereignty is so important. Now, the particular case of ARM, of course, is uh, something that I'm, uh, I'm very exercised about because it's uh, arguably one of my greatest achievements. Uh, ARM is used in over 95% of smartphones in the world and is one of the very few globally relevant companies in Europe. And if ARM was uh, allowed to be bought by NVIDIA, we would see another American monopoly, this time in microprocessors. And we would end up with the ridiculous situation that uh, a British company would have to ask an American president uh, for a permission to sell whoever they want to sell to. Uh, it would be a disaster for uh, Cambridge, uh, of course, where the company is headquartered, for the UK and also for Europe. Well, that leads uh, to, to my uh, next question uh, about regulations. Uh, the, does Europe need uh, regulations uh, in, in this context, additional regulation rules? And in general, uh, what regulations does Europe need uh, to boost entrepreneurship and close the gap? Uh, yes, regulations, in fact, is uh, one of our strengths in Europe. Uh, in order to support uh, entrepreneurship, it is very important uh, that we have uh, a legal environment uh, that is very conducive to um, entrepreneurship and uh, innovation. Uh, this includes generous IPR rules for universities. Producing spin-outs from our university system is still much more laborious and much more tedious than uh, with uh, American universities, European universities often charge far too much for the uh, for the IP. Uh, they should uh, take uh, uh, rules like uh, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, where uh, you give uh, five percent of your company for uh, all the IP that you need uh, and uh, do it quickly. Uh, you know, in some Euro European universities, it takes a year or two years to negotiate IP agreements. In America, you can normally do it uh, in a week or two. Herman, uh, can you comment on uh, European uh, competition uh, regulations? Is that a, a good uh, thing and uh, does it help uh, innovation in Europe or is it the opposite? Uh, no, I think it's one of our great strengths. Uh, and I'm a great admirer of uh, Commissioner Vestager. Uh, she has done a wonderful job uh, 
and she is an example to the world on how to implement competition law. In fact, there is a, a wonderful book by uh, a French professor who is now uh, in America at MIT called The Great Reversal. And what he shows that America, of course, you, it, you used to have very strong competition law, uh, but sadly, they have allowed uh, competition laws uh, to become toothless. And that's how uh, America has ended up with these monopolies like uh, the GAFA companies. And Europe has a very strong um, uh, competition law. And therefore, Europe now has uh, the best telephone system, the lowest cost of internet access. Uh, internet access is three times cheaper in Europe than in the US, to, to everybody's surprise. Europe has a great education system and breeds a great talent uh, in, in its universities. Um, Europe is also very strong in research, uh, right? And, and however, uh, we don't create enough dominant tech companies. Well, one problem is it's just money. <laughs> you know, there is still only a fifth of the venture money available in Europe compared with the US. The second is a cultural change. We still have a, a problem uh, with failure in Europe. Uh, in, uh, and people are still afraid that they uh, uh, might uh, not want to start a risky high-tech venture uh, because it could fail. And of course, often it will. Uh, but people need to get more comfortable with uh, failure. And when they fail, they'll just pick themselves up and try again. Um, so failure doesn't mean that for the rest of their lives, uh, they're not allowed to do a, another company um, if they fail uh, fairly as, uh, as uh, people normally do. Deep tech is the wave of innovation based on research, uh, sophisticated technologies that are hard to reproduce and give you a competitive advantage. Is deep tech the area Europe should focus on, Herman? And is Europe well positioned to lead in deep tech? Yes, it is. Deep tech has become a, a very popular asset class to invest in because people realize that if you, if you can invest in deep tech and you do have a, a, a very fundamental breakthrough and you build company on it, it is much more defensible. So you can big, build really quite large companies. Um, and as you point out, uh, Europe has a phenomenal strength in uh, research. Uh, we still have some of the best uh, universities uh, in the world uh, in Europe. Um, we just don't get these university results out into the market as efficiently as America, for example, and sadly not as efficiently as China. Building on that, can uh, research be led by design towards entrepreneurship, you think? Or is Blue Sky Research something to still invest on, uh, invest in for Europe? I, I think it's very important to uh, leave uh, uh, Blue Sky Research. Um, it's been proven many, many times that if you give clear guidance of what uh, professors should research in, you don't get, get these breakthrough results. Uh, the top researchers in the world really have to follow their nose. When, then they come up with these real breakthrough results. Now, when these breakthrough results happen in European universities, as they invariably do, then the important point is to first recognize that this is a breakthrough and this is an important breakthrough. Uh, study whether this breakthrough actually has market relevance. And if it does, make sure that the breakthrough is actually translated into a company or uh, uh, sometimes when it's a, an evolutionary breakthrough um, is licensed to uh, some of our, our very large European companies. So there are, I distinguish between evolutionary breakthroughs and revolutionary breakthroughs. Evolutionary ones fit into big companies. Revolutionary breakthroughs really need to be done in startups. Uh, where you have to have a dedicated team of people who just believe in this crazy new idea. And then you get uh, these, these great success stories. Large companies are not very good at dealing with uh, revolutionary breakthroughs. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, European versus American investors. Are the European investors taking fewer risks than the Americans? Venture capitalists uh, all over the world are risk takers. So the main problem in Europe is just there isn't enough venture capital around. 
in particular, there still isn't uh, enough deep technology uh, venture capital around, although the EIC, of course, uh, helps a lot. The problem with Europe has been that Europe traditionally uh, used bank financing to uh, finance uh, new companies, but bank financing and, lo and loans and lending, of course, is not appropriate uh, for high tech. It really needs to be equity finance. So it's really the change from loan financing to equity financing uh, where Europe really still lags behind the US and sadly also China. There's also a lot of uh, other uh, concerns about the state of the planet, uh, climate change, inequality, instability, and so forth. In that context, is, uh, according to you, Herman, uh, financial growth uh, still the main driver or the only driver for investors? Uh, or, other, or are other criteria important uh, uh, from now on? Uh, of course, financial uh, considerations uh, are still very, very important. But in addition to financial uh, considerations, all uh, investors now have uh, ESG uh, conditions. They have uh, diversity uh, aims. Uh, we've just done a big uh, diversity project at uh, Amadeus, my venture capital firm. Uh, there are now guidelines, as you know, both in Germany and uh, France about uh, minimum percentage of uh, women in, on boards. And uh, a climate change, of course, is a, uh, has become the number one project for Europe. We want Europe to lead, uh, in digital in particular, uh, build the next wave of tech giants, uh, clear societal impact. So... Uh, what would be your top recommendations for Europe to get there? Well, we need to uh, realize that uh, deep technology in, in particular, but uh, uh, high tech in general, is moving at a phenomenal pace. There are new games uh, and new technologies appearing all the time. And the four that I am particularly excited about, this opportunity to produce quantum computers, we have got some of the best quantum computer groups in the world in Europe. Uh, we can lead in quantum computers as long as we've got enough money going uh, into the quantum computer field and allow uh, European companies to play on a global, uh, at a global scale. Herman, thank you very much for your insights and for spending uh, time with me today uh, within our Makers and Shapers series. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.